I want to say a great big welcome to all of those of you who are watching us right now on Facebook and YouTube. Certainly, if you're catching a replay, make sure you leave a comment on both platforms so that we'll be able to get back with you. And I love reading your comments, and I'm so excited to have you with us today. So today, for our meditation, we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 1, and not the entirety, but selected verses from verse number 19 through verse number 26. I want to quickly remind you to catch our Bible study part five. And this week we're talking about three tips for interpreting scripture, how to get more out of Bible study that is on YouTube right now. You can find it at Dr. A. Reginald Littman. Search my name. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you hit the bell notification and you'll get notifications every time content is loaded as well. Search New Mountaintop Baptist Church and likewise hit that subscribe button and you will get notifications every time content is loaded. You need to be connected to both pages because there are some things that I will post on my personal page that won't go on our church page. And so today I want to share with you about a better life in Christ. We find the words of Paul in Philippians chapter number one, verse number 19 and 20. And it reads like this. I am going to keep on being glad, for I know that as you pray for me and as the Holy Spirit helps me, this is all going to turn out for my good. Listen to Paul now. He's sitting in prison, remember. This is a prison letter to a church that he loves so well, the church at Philippi. Verse number 20. For I live in eager expectation and hope that I will never do anything that will cause me to be ashamed of myself, but that I will always be ready to speak out boldly for Christ. While I am going through all these trials here, just as I have in the past, and that I will always be an honor to Christ, whether I live or whether I must die. Now in these verses, Paul is teaching us about how to have a better life in Christ Jesus. And here's the first principle that we learn from Paul's teachings. Number one, living joyfully is a decision. Living joyfully is a decision. Because watch what Paul says here. He says, I am going to keep on being glad. Now he's in prison. He's separated and isolated from the people that he loves so well. Yet he says, that living with joy is a choice that I have the right to make. And that's what I want to nail in today to let you know that living with joy is your choice. You have the right to choose living with joy. You can either live with grief. You can live with sorrow. You can live with sadness. You can live with your face all tore up. You can live concentrating on everything that's going wrong or you can identify the things that are still going right in spite of all that is going wrong. And that's what Paul is telling us in this 19th verse. I'm going to keep on being glad in prison, away from the people he loves, uncertain of his outcome, doesn't know what's going to happen in his future. Yet he says, in spite of it all, I'm going to keep on being glad. That's a decision you ought to make for your own life. That no matter what things look like, what it tastes like, what it feels like, I'm going to keep on being glad. I'm going to keep on having joy. Here's why. For I know that as you pray for me and as the Holy Spirit helps me, this is all going to turn out for my good. Can you use that today? I know I can. Just being reminded that I'm not alone, that even if you're in a house by yourself, you're still not alone, that there are others who are praying for you that you cannot see. Not only your friends praying for you, not only is your family praying for you. If you have a pastor, if I'm your pastor, you are definitely covered in prayer. But beyond that, there's a prayer life going on right now on your behalf that is way higher than your pastor. Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father right now, and he is praying for you. And Paul says, I know that as you pray for me and as the Holy Spirit helps me, this is all going to turn out for my good. 
What a word that is that I can live in joy. I can decide to live with peace. I can decide to live in happiness. I can decide to live with a smile on my face in spite of how much or little money is in my pocket because there is prayer going on for me. And I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that I'm going to keep on being glad. And I know that even if all else fails, the Holy Spirit helps me. Verse 19. And he never stops helping us. Isn't that wonderful? Verse number 20 says, for I live in eager expectation and hope that I will never do anything that will cause me to be ashamed of myself, but that I will always be ready to speak out boldly for Christ. While I'm going through all these trials here, just as I have in the past, and that I will always be an honor to Christ, whether I live or or whether I die. Not only does Paul teach us that living joyfully is a decision, but secondly, in that 20th verse, Paul teaches us that living to please the Lord must be our desire. Living to please the Lord must be our desire. Not to please people, but living to please the Lord. He says, for I live in eager expectation, eager expectation and hope Watch this, that I will never do anything that will cause me to be ashamed of myself. So Paul is focusing on how he views his own life. He's not looking through the eyes of other people, but how he views himself. That's good self-esteem and good self-health when you are concerned about how you look to yourself. But not only does he say that. Eager expectation and hope that I will never do anything that will cause me to be ashamed of myself, but that I will always be ready to speak out how boldly for Christ while I'm going through all these trials here. So he is also concerned, moreover, about how he appears in the eyes of Christ. And notice what he says. He says, just as I have in the past. And here it is, and that I will always be an honor to Christ, whether I live or whether I must die. And you've got to see yourself through a very holy and wholesome set of eyes. You've got to look at your life. Stop worrying about what everybody else thinks about you, what everybody else has to say about you. Stop worrying about the gossip committee and the rumor mill and stop worrying about the parking lot committee that has meetings before the meetings and meetings after the meetings about the meeting that was before the meeting and after the meeting and start looking at your life through these eyes. Am I letting myself down? And am I more importantly letting the Lord down? You see, I want the Lord to be pleased with what I do. And I want to also be pleased with my own life. There is nothing worse than having the weight of your own self degradation on your shoulder to the point that you are no longer happy with yourself. Too many of us live to please other people. And too many of us live without a real good place of self worth. You've got to know who you are. You got to know who you belong to. And you got to know everybody's not going to support you. He says in this prior part of this chapter that some folks are preaching that have never preached before. They are starting up their little ministries now, (laughs) turning on their little cell phones and uh, preacherizing themselves and doing everything they can to pull away from the foundation that I built. And you'll find that in their first chapter. But Paul says, whatever, (laughs) who cares? All that matters is whether they are preaching with wrong motives or not, that the gospel of Jesus Christ go forward and that the gospel be preached. So you've got to see yourself through a healthy lens, not above where you really are, but you've got to learn how to celebrate yourself and that as long as the Lord Jesus Christ is pleased with your life, that's all that matters. So forgive yourself for all that you've done wrong because he's forgiven you. 
let yourself off the hook for the mistakes you've made because he's let you off the hook. Let go of your painful past. Let go of your bad choices. He's already let go of it. And if the Lord has already let go of it, and if your life is now pleasing in his sight, I don't care what you did in your teens, 20s, terrible 30s, forcible 40s, fearful 50s, seasons, 60s, settle 70s, aching 80s, or nebulent 90s, or maybe even now in your heaven-bound hundreds, it doesn't matter. As long as the Lord is pleased, you be pleased. And don't worry about everybody else. So living to please the Lord must be our desire. That's what Paul wanted more than anything in the world was to make the Lord happy. Now, when we look at verse number 21 through 24, and I'll be praying in just a minute. And we're in first, we're in Philippians, the first chapter, verse number 21 through 24. Look at verse 21 with me now. For to me, living means opportunities for Christ. Now, by the way, Paul is at a point in his life at which Paul uh, was toward the close of his life. He knew that his end was imminent, that he was coming to the end of his journey, but he didn't know exactly when the Lord was going to take him home. But I love Paul's approach to this whole concept of end of life. You see, because Paul lived until the day he died. And many of us have stopped living. I mean, way before this see thing that I no longer give attention to way before this, we've stopped living. We thought that we've reached a certain age and a certain stage. Maybe you've retired from your job. Maybe you feel like, well, my best days are behind me and there's nothing left for me to do. And I'm, as one gentleman said to me, I'm just waiting on the Lord to come and swing low sweet chariot and pick me up and carry me home. And I said to that gentleman, I said, well, sir, I want to remind you of two things. Number one, you have grandchildren which means they still need you to help them to develop and to evolve and to become into the man that you have. This particular man was very successful. He had been uh, a bank president, um, very successful, well-to-do. And I said, I want to remind you, sir, that you have grandsons that need you. They need your direction. They need what you have to offer. And your life is not over. As long as they are here, you are still here. And then secondly, I said to him, I want to remind you that your job is not done here on earth. You see, you don't stop giving until you stop living. Let me rewind that. Let me rewind that. Let me rewind. Let me find that play button. You don't stop giving until you stop living. And that's the mindset that the apostle Paul has. Because watch what he says here again. For me to to for to, to me, living means opportunities for Christ. As long as I'm alive, it means that I can do something for Jesus. And dying, well, I mean, that's better, he says, yet. I mean, you have to remember he's at the end of his journey. He's been in prison, he's been in shipwrecks, he's been beaten, he's been from trumped up court trial to trumped up jailing and he's in prison now and he's won all these people to Christ. He's wrote two thirds of the new Testament. So he is toward the end of his journey. So he feels. And so then when he's talking about death here, he's not wishing and hoping for death. He's just saying that there's something greater than this life. Now I know we don't like to talk about it and I don't like to talk about it either, but we need to be reminded that this is not the end. No, this is not all there is to life. We have something called life everlasting and life eternal that goes beyond this world and its crisis and its problems. Those who who are born again know that Paul also says that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And so death for the believer is not something that we look forward to as they did in the days of the scriptures as they were being written, but it is a promotion and a graduation that takes us away from the pain and the agony and the suffering and the cruelty of this world and into absolute bliss in eternity, being in the presence of the Lord forever. So when Paul says 
Uh, for me to live means it's more opportunities for Christ and then dying. Well, that's better even yet. He's saying that the, re- the rewards are there waiting on him in heaven. But don't be in a hurry to go to heaven. All right. Now, verse 22. But if living will give me more opportunities to win people to Christ, then I really don't know which is better to live or to die. And watch what he says now. Verse 23. Sometimes I want to live and at other times I don't for I long to go and be with Christ. How much happier for me than being here. But watch verse 24. Here it is. But the fact is that I can be of more help to you by staying. So here's our second major point. Living on purpose means helping others find destiny. This whole section of this chapter is all about helping other people find their destiny, helping other people discover Christ, helping other people to walk with Jesus. What if we all lived our lives like that? That we were willing, if we had the choice, to delay death in order to help others discover destiny. What if we live to that point that we were willing to put off the bliss of heaven, that we might help others find the blessing of him. That's where Paul is right now in this first chapter of Philippians. Living on purpose means helping others find destiny. And so when we look at this powerful, powerful, powerful passage of scripture, it just reminds us that there is so much more to life. There's so much more to living that there's so much more that we have to offer. And I want to encourage you, my friend, to trust God as he leads you in living a better life for him. Well, let's pray. Pray with me. Send up hearts, raise hands, and let's go to our great Father, our eternal, all-wise, and omnipotent God. Pray with me now. Father, we thank you for these words from the Apostle Paul that have taught us that we must live until the day we die. Thank you for these words that have taught us, O God, to not stop giving until we stop living. Thank you, Lord, for this word reminds us that we must live on purpose, that we must help others to find their destiny, that we must live according to the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, help us to live a better life in Christ that we may know what it is to walk with you, to talk with you, to represent you, to be a part of kingdom building. Help us to live not to please other folks, but help us to live to please you because ultimately it is you that we want to see. It is you that we want to be with forever. And God, I pray right now that even in this time, that you would help us to develop a healthy self of sense of self. Help us to see the greatness you put in us. Help us, Lord, to see opportunities to share you with other people. Help us to live in such a manner that they will want to follow our example in Christ. And Lord, we thank you for these reflections from the Apostle Paul. Thank you, Lord, for peace in the midst of it all. Thank you for a better life in Christ. Because, God, you are reminding us today that without you at the center of it all, (laughs) God, there is no life. Without you at the center of our being, there is no power. Without you... At the center of our heart, there is no major purpose, value, and power in life. So, God, be the center of our joy. Be our everything. Be our king. Be our God. Be our Lord. Be our strength. Be our redeemer. And in these dark days, we thank you 
that we know where the light is. And we turn that light on right now. And we say, God, have your way. God, keep us. God, fix all that is wrong. Touch our president. Give him a heart for you and a heart for the people. Touch all those who surround him, that they will have the wisdom to lead us through these traumatic experiences. Lord, I pray for those who have lost loved ones. I pray today, God, for Miss Shirley Williams who lost her brother. Lord, lay your hands on her and give her strength right now. I pray for Mackenzie Tessier and his family in the loss of his sister to COVID-19. God, you're a healer and you healed, you healed broken hearts and you mend broken spirits. And we trust you now to do what you do. Father, we stretch our hands to thee, no other help we know. If thou would draw thyself from us, oh, whither shall we go? Now, Lord, touch your children, strengthen your family, and we will lift you up and give you all of the praises. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You know, there's something about prayer that just makes you feel better. It makes your burden so much lighter. There's something about prayer that lifts the heavy load off your shoulders. I want you to trust the Lord. Live with purpose. Find ways to be a blessing to other people, to lead people into divine destiny. That is your purpose. And until you take your last breath, you have not given your last gift. So give to others. Love, give peace, give grace, give forgiveness, give mercy to others that they may indeed know what it means to be connected with a child of God. I praise God for you and I pray that you will embrace a better life in Jesus Christ through these teachings from Philippians. Make sure you go back and watch the video, share the video and comment. I look forward to reading your comments. Let me quickly remind you again that part five is now available on YouTube. You can go right now and watch it. Three tips for interpreting scripture, how to get more out of Bible study. And that is part five. Look forward to sharing with you again Monday through Friday, 12 noon. Be sure to join us Monday through Friday, 12 noon, right here as the Lord continues to bless us. God bless you. Have a wonderful Wednesday.